Welcome back to the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. Maternity services haven't stopped over the last 16 months, and neither have we. We've continued to bring maternity and midwifery professionals and students the latest policy updates, best clinical and technical innovations, and research via our live streamed festivals throughout the pandemic. We've introduced the Maternity and Midwifery Hour to enable healthcare professionals to come together as a community each week to share their experiences. We've even added a new festival to our annual series. The Student Midwife Experience Festival will take place on the 10th of November in Manchester and will be a great opportunity for student midwives and academics to examine how the current curriculum will react to changes in maternity services. We'll also be talking about what students want and how universities and educators can adapt their courses, mixing practical and online learning. We've also redesigned the Maternity and Midwifery Forum website to create a space where you can catch up with all the latest articles, watch videos, find out about forthcoming events and advertise your own. Not satisfied with that, we will shortly be launching our new Maternity and Midwifery Services and Products directory, a one-stop shop for all healthcare professionals who want to find out about the latest products, services, career opportunities, campaigns, courses and resources. Take part in our exhibition competition today and get an early glimpse of the directory before it is launched to maternity and midwifery professionals and students later in July. Welcome to this week's uh, edition of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. My name's Neil Stewart and I'm the Editorial Director at uh, the uh, Maternity and Midwifery Forum. Uh, Sue McDonald is off having a holiday, probably still recovering from the football yesterday or watching Andy Murray tonight. Uh, so we've got competition. Um, I'm joined this evening by uh, two very interesting uh, speakers. Uh, Diane Garland, who will be familiar to some of you, um, she's a freelance uh, midwife, uh, published expert in uh, water births, and uh, uh, all-round uh, interesting person on these subjects. And uh, with her is uh, Kavari Myra, who's a postgraduate research student at Southampton, wide experience of uh, midwifery in India, but also an expert looking at obstetrics violence. Um, this is the week of the last episode of the International Congress of Midwives and our topic tonight is uh, international trends. But before we start, um, can I ask uh, Kavari, first of all you, what's your moment of the week? What human thing? We can see the plan for your PhD on the wall behind you, but what's been your moment of the week? That's not the moment of my week, definitely not. That's what the whole week's uh, been about. But um, I, I struggled to choose between two things. One, I, uh, my sister finally got vaccinated. My family is back in India, and we have had a tough time in, you know, finding one of those slots for her. So even though she's like quite older than me. But but yeah, so finally I got a news that she got vaccinated and a competing moment is I tried pole dancing, which was quite amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know which one is a better moment, but both were quite, quite amazing. <laughs> okay, vaccination and pole dancing. I think that's probably a first. So Diane, I guess your moment of the week isn't pole dancing. So <laughs> you know Definitely too old for pole dancing. Uh, well, you, you beat me because I was actually going to say two quicks as well, if I may. First one, I guess, uh, professional. Um, lots and lots of inquiries now for face-to-face -face teaching. So people are looking professionally as moving after COVID, which I think is fantastic for all of us to perhaps move away to some degree about Zoom. Um, and then the other one was a personal one. I don't know if anyone's watched the news, but there's been a tremendous heat wave in Canada and we've got friends in Canada and I managed to catch up with them. They're quite elderly and I was very concerned as it was 50 degrees. They live on Vancouver Island and uh, caught up with them both today. Them and their families are all safe. So one personal, one professional. Very good. 
Well, my moment of the week is I managed to speak to one of my sons who has been stranded in America for the entire of the uh, pandemic, um, but he has to wind his way back this summer. So it'll be the first time that we'll see him in two years. Um, so uh, thanks to both our guests. But uh, first of all, let me start off with uh, some comments and the news of the week. Uh, I can't come up to Sue McDonald's uh, standards, but uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, a big thanks to everybody at uh, Matflix, maternity experts. Uh, there was the Maternity and Midwifery Festival, the Northern Festival was held yesterday. And so another 25 presentations are being added to the catalog that you can all use uh, for your revalidation and for CPD and for catching up or for research if you're involved in research or for teaching. Uh, so go and check out Matflix. Uh, and a big thanks to uh, Sheena Byron and the others at uh, All for Maternity. We've had a joint stand at the ICM this past few weeks, um, supporting everything that's been going on. And uh, uh, they've introduced us uh, to Kavari this evening. And I think that's gonna be very interesting. So a couple of bits of news just to keep things going along. Um, bit of headline news, really. You've, the Nursing and Midwifery Council has issued a press release warning nurses and midwives to watch out for fraud callers um, in case somebody phones up claiming to be from them, asking for your details mm. and asking to make uh, you to make payments either for your registration or for revalidation. And I was just reflecting that, of course, Many people who are midwives and nurses probably mention that in their uh, social media and in all their public persona. So, but the Nursing Midwifery Council say that, like the banks, they never phone up, they never ask for these kind of details, they'll never ask for money online. So if anybody comes along trying to impersonate them, uh, anything to do with your registration, it's likely to be a fraud. So we're very keen to um, give them a shout out for that. Uh, Nursing Midwifery Council has also got uh, a new uh, chairman, and his name is Sir David Warren, and he is a former ambassador to Japan. Now, I know later on I will ask Diane, who's uh, done some work in Japan, if there's anything that Japanese midwives do that's different, uh, since we now have an ex-Japanese ambassador in charge. But I think he's there for his regulation uh, strengths. As I mentioned earlier, uh, today is the final day of the International Confederation of Midwives Congress, I think the 32nd uh, triannual. Uh, both our colleagues later have been speakers at it. Uh, but it's been, interestingly, it's been five individual days spread across a whole month. And I think a big shout out to Frank Acadi and Sally Permain and the, all the people at the ICM for a very, very clever way of spreading out materials so that they're uh, busy schedules. And they did get almost 2,000 uh, people participating. And it's available for, I think, another two months for those of you who have to do catch up and on demand. Um, interestingly, NICE have uh, just announced a whole set of new guidelines on uh, pelvic uh, women and pelvic floor. Uh, health, uh, because last week uh, we had Abigail Holmes doing her piece on how important it was. So that's not bad. From the maternity midwifery hour, one week later, uh, NICE agree to follow our lead. Uh, you know, shows that we're getting somewhere. Um, but again, uh, you know, work that uh, people like Jackie Dunkley Bent and others have been pursuing for some time. And those of you that remember the row about uh, normalizing incontinence and uh, tenor pants, etc. So things, even in the midst of uh, COVID, seem to be uh, moving. So well done to all of them. Um, but it was interesting to watch some bits of the ICM. Uh, and we'll come on to some of that in a moment. But the uh, Dr. Thedros, the director general, was reminding everyone that uh, there was an estimate of 900,000 midwives short in the world for the number of uh, children that are being born, that he believes if we had them, we'd be able to save 80% of the mothers and children who die in childbirth. And the figure he quoted was 4.3 million deaths a year, which to put in perspective is higher than the number of people that John Hopkins say have died of uh, COVID. Although I don't doubt that the COVID numbers 
And it is a reflection that we've had this huge response to COVID. And yet with issues like malaria and uh, mother and child mortality rates, which have been high for years, somehow we've not managed the same level of mobilization. So I think there's some reflection there uh, about that over the coming period as we try and go back to normal. We missed June the 21st. Last week was meant to be uh, Freedom Day in the UK when we all came out of lockdown, but the uh, infection rates appear, the, appear to be rising, um, although happily the death rate is not rising so fast. But what that means for us all in the autumn, particularly for those working in healthcare services as to whether or not we really will be returning to normal or whether, as some people have predicted, the long tail of this uh, virus is going to carry through into next year and still going to be affecting the way uh, people work. So um, a moment just to think of uh, the people who've been badly affected and by all our colleagues who over the months have lost their lives uh, with from this infection. Uh, those people who went up to the front line, happily the rate of death is going down, but it still remains uh, very dangerous. And we're still discovering the impacts of long COVID. And so I think we're gonna be living with this as they have predicted for uh, quite some time. So um, let's move on to our subject for tonight. As I said, we were expecting that we would be able to turn our eyes to the rest of the world after lockdown finished. Uh, that bit of planning sort of fell off, but nonetheless, we want to have a look at some of the international trends because as I said, the International Confederation have been, they've been meeting in Bali, but it's quite obvious that they're all still in their own front rooms, uh, but they've, it's been very successful. But the themes and the presentations have allowed us to turn our eyes away from our own problems and remember the scale of the challenges and the disruptions that uh, midwives and maternity workers have experienced all around the world. And in the ways in which we have seen in the United Kingdom, uh, some of the advances, whether it's in home births, water births, and midwifery led care, some things can be reversed very quickly uh, in the face of a, a pandemic, even when many people would say that those courses of action were not uh, justified. So it's a reminder of how fragile some of the progress that midwifery has made over the past decade could well uh, be. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, to be joined by uh, Diane Garland. Uh, hello, Diane, Hi. Uh, who is a freelance midwife, but uh, she's published. Uh, she's an expert on water birth. Uh, she's a, an inspector, if you're called an inspector for the CQC. Um, but it's she's SPA, great specialist advisors. Special advisors. I bet when you come in, it looks like inspectors. <laughs> um, and I bet it feels like inspectors. Um, but she has a very, very uh, wide range of experience. And she's going to reflect on some of the things that she has seen and heard from the International uh, Confederation of Midwives and some of her own comments and just broaden our perspective out a bit tonight. So Diane, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. I'm just going to share my screen. You'll be glad to know that it isn't um, PowerPoint to the nth degree. It's just, uh, get them up. Oh, where'd they go? Oh, hang on. Yeah, having just about to say that technology is being fab, you see, I messed it up on the first go. Uh, go back to there. No, there. don't worry. Uh, we're still doing better than the BBC oh. and ITV. I don't know why it uh, keeps jumping to my last slide. I don't want my last slide. I want my first slide there from beginning. Oh, I am so sorry. I've not had any problems at all with uh, any Zooms all through all of this. Now tonight it decides to play up. Right, we can defeat it if we have to. Current slide. No, it's still going back to the last one. If Joe's there, can she put my slides up if mine don't want to behave? Oh, 
because I'm only getting a small screen for some reason. Oh, well, I can see your slides. Yeah, but only small screen. Does that matter? Is there only five? Is that all right? I don't want to hold everyone up. Don't know why it's uh, doing this, as I say. It's always been good up until now. I'm going to stick with that because I don't want to hold everyone up. There's only five slides. Um, and obviously we film these so you can always uh, see them. Yeah, so thank you. Um, before Sue went on her break, um, she asked me the other day about any highlights from ICM and obviously any themes. And it was really hard to pick out. I've been very fortunate not just to be able to watch quite a lot of the uh, sessions over the last five weeks, but probably more importantly for me, um, this was a, a unique ICM because we've already said it went virtual, but I've actually been attending ICM since 1990, um, which I suspect Cara is probably maybe not even born then, so that's made me feel even older. But um, certainly from my point of view, all those 10 prior to this one have all had their own uniqueness and this being virtual, I think Neil already thanked, but I think we have to thank the um, organizers. They've done a tremendous job with the program. They've certainly done an amazing job with the technology, the time zones. I just think they've been quite amazing what they've managed to do. So let's all just hope we can meet, you know, in Bali, um, you know, in 2023, they're looking for. So what I've picked out um, is just five sessions that had some degree of interest as well as impact on me. And there were so many, it's quite hard to pick out them, but I only wanted to look at five, if that's okay. Let's see where we go. No, it's still playing up. Is Jo there? Can she? Um... Yeah, I think so. it's going to be easy. It's obviously playing up for me. We just bring up the second slide, if we may. Just give her a second. So yeah, I picked out five, as I say, that were of interest to me. And one of the things I've always done with them, um, oh, no, that's not right, because you've got a gap. No, you've got a gap, that's the old set, I'm afraid. I sent Neil some others this afternoon. Technology, huh? There we are, I'll use these, they seem to be working. So yeah, um, it is always difficult to pick out some, but the first one I've picked out is Midwives and the Media. Now, normally when I'm, I'm at ICM, I always try to go to sessions that perhaps wouldn't initially jump out and grab me. And I do try and go to international sessions, not just colleagues that I know, whether they're UK or beyond, um, but perhaps co colleagues I'd never normally meet. Can you hear me? Yes. You can't see the slide. Oh dear. I'm so sorry, guys. This has never, ever happened before. Let me come out and try again. It's just not my evening, is it, tonight? Yeah, we're there was that about fourth time lucky so yeah pick out sessions that I wouldn't normally perhaps um, think of first of all so this one midwives in the media struck me because one of the things that has been coming out a lot recently is about how midwives interact with the media and particularly social media and we know that there are guidance both from our world college and also from the NMC about that but this one grabbed me because of where the colleagues were speaking from and as you can see it was a, a mixed international session as most are. This was Kenya, Afghanistan and Mexico. And I thought, wow, this is going to be interesting. What are they going to talk about? And um, Neil, I think, has already mentioned one of the um, items they discussed was about how high profile obstetric violence is at the moment in the media. And they talked about it in their own countries and the impact it has on women and families. And I thought, well, what can we do? as midwives to get our stories out there. But in fact, one of the journalists who was the lady from Mexico, she actually eventually jumped in and said, well, we like what we call lived stories, things that are reality, things that are really happening in your place of work and not just things like obstetric violence. But all of those stories, as we would expect, need to have respectful and in a confidential way. And 
with that in mind, I've actually just started to write an article that I'm going to get published. I'm not sure where yet, um, because it is a lived story. It's a true story. And the mother and the doula who were involved in that particular birth are going to write it with me. So we'll get the multi-international, multi-professional um, angle, as well as obviously a, a birth story from a mother. But I just thought that was an interesting one to hear it from journalists and not actually just from us, which often at ICM, we don't always get a lot of other um, practitioners who attend, but being virtual, I think has got to be a benefit of that because those journalists may not have traveled all the way across to Bali had it not been for the virtual scenario we were in. Another session that drew me to it was about vulnerable women and it was, very little information sometimes given when you look at the ICM bios and what's actually going to be discussed. But these colleagues, as you can see, again, international from the UK, USA, Netherlands and Belgium. And I thought if I can just pick out two or three aspects of every presentation that might whet your appetite, either for this ICM to go back if you've got the chance to watch and or for the future ones. And that's not just about attending. It's about putting papers in. Please, please, please. Your papers are invaluable to colleagues around the world. So Neil's mentioned, I actually do work with the CQC. Um, I'm a specialist advisor. But what was interesting, and it was the colleague from the UK, she actually mentioned that there are no specialist midwives on the CQC when they go into prisons. And that had never occurred to me. I mean, I know my specialist area when I go to a particular hospital to um, inspect. So that was something that I will feed back that has just come up as a, a, a comment almost in her presentation. And she again showed photos of what a um, environment looks like for a mother and a baby in a prison. And that was just one of the photos I got of stock photos. So we talk a lot about um, birth and postnatal environments, perinatal mental health, but um, that's the sort of scenario that she was working in. The other thing, and it's again about trying to think of positivities um, post-COVID, whatever that looks like for the future. But one of the speakers, and it was the American uh, midwife was saying that during COVID in America, they actually um, now have different alternatives to custodial sentences. In other words, they didn't want mothers, stroke mothers and babies, in a custodial sentence during COVID. And she was saying they're hoping that that will continue um, post COVID. So again, a positivity that can come out from something that has been so devastating to so many of us around the world. Very different angle. I did say there were just so many different sessions and it's trying to pick out the ones, not just for this evening, but when you're trying to decide, you know, during your day, which ones to watch. So the complementary therapies one was only today, which is why there was a blank on the slide that I'd originally sent in. Um, and again, colleagues from all around the world, Australia, Indonesia and India, all looking at their interest in a variety of different therapies. So we had aromatherapy, we had um, therapies to help perineal healing, we had, um, they put it under acupuncture, but I think it'd be more like acupressure. Um, really interesting different aspects on complementary therapies, which is also of great interest to me, hence why it drew me to this subject. What came out as a the biggest theme there, and it wouldn't by any means be unique to the complementary therapies, is that we need more research. Well, yeah, and that will lead in beautifully in a little while to our other co-colleague here. But they were talking not just about safety and effectiveness, but beautifully, of course, maternal satisfaction with that therapy and midwife education. And as an educationalist, um, that side of it came up and jumped me. And then last week, very interesting, um, presentation by one of the um, companies, 
which again, don't always get high profile when we're actually there live. People don't always go in to listen to the company presentations, but this was Faring International with the Maternity Foundation from ICM. So I felt very comfortable. I know all of ICM's uh, sponsors are baby friendly, et cetera, but this really drew me. Why did it draw me again? Had an angle a little bit about COVID because of trying to store the COVID vaccines in countries that have, you know, a high humidity and high heat. And the thing that jumped out in their opening was that this carbatosin, the use of it in a heat stable environment. So it doesn't need to go into a fridge. So again, as a one off um, dose, to be able to help reduce postpartum hemorrhages in countries that are lower um, eco economy, economy um, was something that really struck me. It's a relatively, by drug um, standards, very cheap. In Faring, are really, they say, are not making any money out of this drug. But they obviously highlighted, sadly, some of the facts. And that was, and they were talking for about 25 minutes, every two minutes, a woman dies during pregnancy or childbirth. The leading cause is postpartum hemorrhage. And the final comments that they made, which links in beautifully to the session before there, which was that we need to upscale midwife skills in low income countries for them to feel confident when it's safe and right to give that particular drug. Now, I am fortunate, I do work abroad normally quite a lot and my, my love is India. I'm an um, advisor to a birth centre there. So that's something I've already sent over to them to actually see how familiar this particular drug is to them because they didn't really highlight to us how widespread that drug is yet. So again, one to watch this space. And then the final one, and I couldn't ever do a session without mentioning the word water. This was a colleagues from America and they presented some of their research and evidence, which they've drawn together from um, a lot of the studies in America. Sadly, and it's not unique to the Americans, if that um, speaker list was Italy, Spain, um, actually Australia to an extent, you would get the same that clinically, even though the evidence and the research exists, there isn't clinical consensus between midwives and doctors. And that sadly has not changed for many, many years in many, many countries. So it's again, the Americans trying to say, look, the evidence is there. The figures were quite interesting. Um, because of different criteria in the studies they looked at, but somewhere between 27 and 70% of women are asked to leave the pool before birth. Now, there are certainly some colleagues who will only ever offer water labor for a whole variety of reasons, and they obviously went through those. But to me, that was a phenomenal amount of women who have gone into a pool. In the UK, we tend to say about it's 50-50. So 50% of women who go in the pool will still get out before they birth. But maybe in America, it's a much wider um, number. And then the final thing, which was from my colleague, Barbara Harper, reminded everyone who was listening in that, and amongst all her beautiful birth stories and photos, was that there's now known to be 120 countries worldwide who use water for labor and birth. And the photo very kindly that is on the bottom there for Emma, she very kindly said I could share it tonight. This is the mother who I'm going to write the, her birth story with. Um, to give you a taster, she had a previous fourth degree tear with forceps last time and was being told she wasn't allowed to go in the pool. And as you can hopefully see, she had a beautiful home water birth. So that's the story we're going to write up. So... Sadly, what did we miss? Well, as you can imagine, there was a lot. So, of course, the colleagues, the interaction, um, the culture, which would have been as will be when we get there in Bali, will just be amazing. And the food, we mustn't forget the food because that links in beautifully with everything else. You know, you, you go off to have a meal with someone. I can remember doing this in Oslo. I'm watching the time now, I promise. And two or three of us at the hotel. Um, said, oh, let's go and have a meal. And as we were walking down the street, you, you can spot a midwife at 50 paces. 
and people say, oh, where you go? Oh, we're going to go to this restaurant because we've heard this is really good. And at the end of it, it turned up about 20 from about 10 different countries. And of course, we tell the stories of how and where we work during those meals. So it's a lot of things that we gain when we can do face to face. But in somewhere like ICM, it enhances so much what we have to share. So those are just hopefully a little taster of um, what we found when we went to ICM. Well, a little taster with a lovely picture of delicious food that uh, none of us can have this evening. No. Um, that was brilliant, Diane, thank you very much. And interesting that you start with, you know, um, the reflections at the ICM on the role of the media, because um, the agenda, of course, was written originally for 2020, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they've adapted it. Um, and of the many uh, presentations, and I think, I think in total I counted about 240 um, over the five days. So it will be a fantastic box set when it comes out. Um, there was a long list of, you know, uh, the clinical issues, uh, genetics, advances in practice, new bits of research, but a really big push um, to get maternity and midwifery up the political agenda to set it in a media context and also to set it in the context of uh, gender issues and uh, what is happening to women and also what is happening uh, to midwives as women working with women and the importance of that and it was very striking that uh, social theme that was running all the way through. Uh, Quite an interesting reminder there when you look across countries like uh, Mexico, where cesarean rates uh, in the hospital sector, where people are accessing care, uh, are 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, we know about the situation in uh, Brazil. We know that during the COVID period, a lot of these things have become even more entrenched. Um, and while we talk about COVID here in the UK and the dangers to individuals, a speaker from South Africa was reminding everybody that 30%, 30% of their mothers present HIV positive. Mm -hmm. They are in the middle of the other great pandemic that's been running uh, for the best part of now uh, 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this range of experience and challenge and uh, puts some of our difficulties uh, into perspective. Mm. And so I'm very pleased um, that uh, Kaveri is able to join us. She's a postgraduate uh, at Southampton, but a lot of her work has been in India um, and been looking at this issue of uh, obstetric uh, violence. Now, Kaveri, can you start off just by describing the kind of work that you've done and the, some of the projects you've worked with in India, and then the, the focus of your research and how you, uh, how you frame this term obstetric violence. So over to you. Thank you, Neil. Um, so I started working on obstetric violence. And when I say working, it's not all formal because I, I did my nursing and midwifery uh, pre-service education in India, in, in government sector at one of the biggest tertiary level hospitals. And I observed the issue firsthand. And there was no terminology that was going around, not, not at least where we were studying. Like there's nothing about obstetric violence or respectful maternity care when I was doing my nursing and midwifery. And this is um, 2004 to 2008. And we do these courses quite at, at a very young age. And uh, seeing women experience violence like that when you know you're still finding out how people give birth and it's it's quite traumatic in itself and nothing prepares you really you know to to observe women getting violated like that and something that looked very normalized like nobody would look back and suddenly if some if if a care provider is slapping a a, a woman giving birth when she's screaming or she's moving her leg and in my country, in the government sector, women usually give birth on something called a labor table, 
it's like very high and very narrow. There's there's like no scientific basis of why women have to give birth on those. But what I have heard in my doctoral research is that it's it's good height maintenance for um, say doctors and care providers for whom it's like elbow level. You don't have to bend too much so that you know women are at that level when you're assisting births. So I saw that and um, I also kind of felt a lot of powerlessness in trying to um, you know, stand up for women. I mean, I was a student midwife and, but just these really extreme cases would, you know, stand out when you would be like, how are you not doing anything? Why would you slap somebody? Why would you pinch somebody with an artery force if she's giving birth? Those were obviously, you know, you see and you know that is, that's not right, that's abuse. But there were other things as well about episiotomy, about uh, you know, not giving a cut to every woman uh, who's uh, a primary uh, and there for the first time. So, so trying to address that at that age kind of had its own repercussions on me. And then after I completed and I, um, you know, felt that, well, why are doctors and why are people who have a say and, you know, are making some, uh, you know, are being heard, there's a difference. They, they have qualification and uh, so th this was quite silly you know not being able to make a change uh, at that uh, level that I decided you know when I finish this at some point I'm going to do a PhD on obstetric violence because then nobody will be able to you know do away or ignore my voice because I will be speaking with research with, with science backing what I'm trying to say and it's been uh, around 13 years since uh, around 10 years Later, I was able to start my PhD here at Southampton. Um, but there are, there are better reasons. I had done quite a bit of research in between as well. And most of my work is in India before I uh, started my PhD. Um, and, and now I look at the evidence around the world and to talk to you about obstetric violence, there's so much that we weren't even thinking about, you know, deciding for these women and these people who give birth and sometimes just being their guardians, like their surrogate decision makers. I have done that, uh, you know, many times because I have been taught to uh, behave like that in a birthing room. And, and I feel there's no one who is a care provider who can, you know, confidently stand up and say that I have never engaged in obstetric violence. Um, what is just that, that's the beginning, you, you acknowledge that and then you see, okay, what, what did we do wrong that we can change? It might not be intentional, it might be something that is embedded in our curriculum of midwifery, of nursing, of medicine, that you can't do anything about. But yes, when you talk about what obstetric violence is, it's very different for different countries. Some things are just plain and simple wrong and a violation of you know women's fundamental human rights. When you talk about the physical violence, the verbal abuse, the sexual abuse, the lack of privacy. But some of the things we, we don't usually, it's so embedded in our culture, depending on how much violence women experience in their regular lives. Then she will you know, tell you whether that was violence, what she experienced while giving birth or not. If she's being hit, if she's being beaten up, if she's experiencing violence in her home environment every day, if she's used to it, that's a normalized thing for her. So at least somebody's assisting, somebody qualified is assisting her birth. And that difference I noticed when I first presented my work at a normal labor and birth conference like four years ago, when I was talking about these extreme forms of violence and I was hearing you know, um, evidence from other parts of the world where the extreme in those Northern uh, global North countries were more about the lack of consent. And I mean, Everybody, nobody gets to have consent where I was, you know, presenting from. So it's just, I mean, that basically is conditioning and your environment and your education and what drives birth and care and, you know, people around it and your own conditioning and how, what, what you feel is wrong. So, so it's not trying to give a particular, you know, definition of obstetric violence because I've always strongly believed the person who gives birth gets to define what obstetric violence is for them and what respectful maternity care is for them. 
which is also something I am doing in my doctoral research with both women in one of the most uh, populated and under uh, resourced states in India called Bihar. And also going to nursing and midwifery leaders at all levels in different like regulation, administration, advocacy, research, education, everything to see how we can make changes in different uh, these sectors to ensure respectful maternity care because so much needs to happen to address obstetric violence and to ensure compassionate care. I mean, that is quite a, a spectrum. I think a lot of um, midwives that are working in this uh, country would be quite shocked about, um, you know, the straightforward, as you describe, um, act, taking action again on women without their consent, but the shouting, the slapping, the pinching, the controlling, um, perhaps referring in other countries a lot, they'll refer entirely to the husband or whoever has rights over the woman. Um, but in many cases, as you say, uh, there's a complete absence of consent or an absence of choice. And as you work your way into some parts of what you describe as the global north, your definition that, of course, if you look at from the woman's point of view, if uh, the professionals think that they are intervening to help, but the woman feels that violence is being performed on her, that sounds more like the dilemma that many midwives are wrestling with in the UK. Um, and of course, there's always controversy about the levels of cesarean, et cetera. What kind of response do you get when you're talking to people in the global north about this? Do they think it's not a problem for them? Do they see the spectrum that you describe? Um, I, they do see the spectrum of abuse. And that is where I have also kind of felt that there is a spectrum because I was completely coming from a um, Indian and Asian perspective, right? And so when I, when I bring all the extreme experience, like extreme negative experience, and um, to give you an example, women, you know, getting a postpartum IUCD inserted without their consent. And this is very, very, uh, you know, say healthcare facility specific. There is like a pattern of abuse that you see in particular places. So you'll see all the women in that surrounding, they will complain about, you know, they have not been consented about getting a PPIUCD inserted. Or in another part of the world, you will see husband stitches very, common and every woman who's coming out of that place is you know talking about that so in terms of consent in in the global north then you know i i was seeing mostly about you know injections or even palpation or even vaginal examination but you know those things you i mean don't even think about asking women's consent women get vaginal examination the care provider goes and just you know, lift their, we call it petticoat or sari. They'll just lift it and they'll just say, checking. If they are in a mood to communicate. And sometimes they will just check it without saying anything. And this goes on with every woman. She experiences like numerous vaginal examinations by different people. And there is such a lack of communication between care providers that, you know, nobody wants to check your documentation. Nobody documents They'll all just come and, you know, insert their fingers and, and everybody wants to see. So those kind of things then help me understand the other side of the spectrum. As others I talk to in Global North are trying to learn these extreme examples when I say, and people are moved to tears actually uh, most of the time, which kind of like, it, it's like a pushback for me. And I wonder like, why am I not crying? Am I, am I losing compassion? These things are my routine life, these stories, everything. Okay. So yeah, it's quite a bit of an exchange. We've, I mean, we've, we've had an extended year of the nurse and the midwife, and one of the big pushes has been around the pillars of regulation and education. And there has been some movement in India on adopting, you know, uh, more training and education expansion of midwifery, a recognition that midwifery is the fastest route to uh, reducing mortality and morbidity in childbirth. Um, are these issues being addressed either 
through the regulators or um, in the rather longer process that would be through education or is that still far away uh, from what you've seen in India? I'm glad you asked that question. I think it's safe to begin uh, by saying that regulation is really, really poor in my country when it comes to uh, midwifery. And right now midwifery is still like, you know, embedded and within nursing. So it's not independent profession yet. So it's nursing council and state nursing councils which are regulating the professions um, in all the states at the national level. That is one kind of regulation and the other is about, you know, is there a law that women can approach and, and see what happens if, if, you know, the experience of obstetric violence. While that is not something I have studied yet and I wish to in future, I have done some research which recently got published on PLOS One about challenges in uh, regulation. And it's one area which we do not usually talk about because when it becomes act and a little bit of legal, we feel uncomfortable. Mm. And I think it's something about being women as well that we do not want to get into those areas that we have not grown up speaking about. We are not comfortable about those areas. It's very poor, but then having said that, starting talking about just the theory and practice match, mismatch, um, not having enough teachers, not having enough equipment, those kind of things are there. But I'm talking about absolute non-existent existence of midwifery council, midwifery profession, uh, a definition of uh, midwives, a scope of practice, but that is changing. A couple of years back, government of India, we launched uh, the operational guidelines for midwifery. And there is a lot of political will at the moment as well. But somewhere we keep getting you know, off track. Like what we are trying to call it is nurse practitioner in midwifery. So some way we are still not giving it its mm -hmm. independence you know, state. Mm -hmm. okay. And until that happens, I don't think it's, you know, worth saying that we have made progress. And it's, we want a direct entry midwifery. Mm. We are, there is still a, a lot of pushback from that. What we are implementing at the moment is 18 months of this course that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, but we have a bill, uh, a, a nursing and midwifery uh, draft uh, bill, which is in the parliament at the moment. We all got to give feedback on that and it's in a very poor shape there's so much let's, that needs to happen let's bring diane back in with us as well since um uh and and while um she's joining us can i just say that uh, again one of the colleagues from south africa today was was pointing out that um you know the, the midwives and things are they're nurse midwives and a lot of them are used interchangeably and maternity nearly always loses out and huge numbers of them are trained but not practicing. And it's very, uh, not cost effective, but it's become institutionalized. I mean, Diane, you're involved in um, inspection and supervision in the UK. And uh, if you were, if you look at how, so take the UK and women in the global north, what they would regard as, as abuse and unacceptable, because we do have uh, much clearer guidelines about consent and intervention and and how you should relate to women. But I'm always very struck by the statistic that says that um, anything up to 30% of women uh, report some kind of birth trauma. Now, some of that may be physiological and, uh, you know, associated with what's happened. But a lot of the examples seem to be, you know, very bad experiences um, and things. How is how do people tackle these kinds of issues on the, uh, at the kind of UK and global north end of the spectrum, where it is about choice or it's about trauma, uh, it's about consent? What's your experience of that? Yeah, interesting question. I think it's really, really difficult. Um, and you're right, the, the, the degree of how we interpret obstetric violence is very different in different countries. I think certainly, as you like to say, in the North, um, 
it's often been more about the issues of consent, but of course there's consent and there's consent. If you're only told half the story, you know, it, we're doing it because, and you don't get the other half of the story, then it's not true consent. Um, you know, we, we live in a multinational country, and yet we know that a lot of women and families, you know, English is not their first language, even if they've lived here many, many years. Simple things like trying to get interpreters is really, really difficult. And, you know, women that I've worked with, um, they don't want a male interpreter at the other end of the phone talking about incredibly personal, private issues. So, you know, I guess it is an awful lot about consent, but you're right. I think for us as well, when I talk to colleagues, whether they're students or support workers, whoever, when I'm interviewing in the inspections, you know, I will always ask about the culture of the organisation, because if you've got a culture of bullying, sarcasm, um, the way that we do not respect each other, that's going to overflow to women very, very quickly, whether it's um, implicit or explicit. So I think we have a toy yeah, Neil. Go on. Kaviri, you, you've spoken about and you mentioned earlier that you didn't think that there was virtually anybody who could say that in, in the teams that you've worked with that they haven't uh, committed some kind of violence. This, the norm, the norm, making that, that kind of behaviour normative in a team so that people don't feel able to speak out. I mean, that seems to me to be an issue that can apply in the global north as well as in the global south. How do, how do midwives break out of that, uh, Kaviri? I don't think we do. And I think when I say that it's important to acknowledge that midwives and uh, nurse midwives in the context of my country, we are, you know, as much victims of a very disrespectful birthing environment and a very insensitive policy environment that makes it very difficult for even the midwives who are most passionate about ensuring you know, respectful maternity care. There's just so much you will see in terms of health systems constraints, in, term, in terms of, you know, what's going on around it, the team culture. Mm -hmm. We are disrespected, abused, bullied, as Diane said, so much that it's like a, it's like a, I'm, I'm forgetting this thing. It's like a, um, there's a game, dominoes. You know, mm -hmm. one person kind of disrespects and abuses the right next person in the hierarchy and it kind of goes on. So it's, it's very much like that. And it's not just about violence, which is prevalent. It's as women, how respected are we in general in our lives? How respected are we in our professions, in our medical hierarchy, in our social hierarchies, then mix, up, mix it up with patriarchy, add some post-colonialism in it. I mean, there's just so much that needs to be considered and the context changed so much that mm -hmm. Diane, I mean, we, in the UK, we are facing now a, a string of investigations, some of them very public. Um, but it seems to me that I'd be surprised if group think and group behaviour uh, and not speaking out don't emerge as some of the key criticisms uh, that come out of those. Um, how, how much of a risk do you think group think and group behaviour in maternity units and things can be? I think you can assist that culture. I mean, I remember when, you know, I first did my nursing back in 1977, and I can remember um, Miss Redmond, who was our lecturer then. I mean, that's how impact she had on me. And the first thing she almost said on that first day was, you know, care for people the way you wished you were cared for. And that goes beautifully into all this issue about how we're treated as women, how we're treated within our families. But I think if we can get that back in, you know, and it is about speaking up, you know, within a family, do you feel confident to speak up? And there will be someone within your family. Um, I can remember when I changed jobs and the person I spoke to was not my parents because I thought they think I'd let them down. I went and spoke to my sister. So I guess it's that situation of finding the people. If you look at some of the midwifery groups and organizations that are out there, um, ARM, Association of Radical Midwives. I mean, the word radical, everyone goes, <gasps> but actually, of course, it's not. It's back to basics. And that's where they started. And that's why I joined it. I wanted an avenue 
to say what I'm seeing at work, is this what everybody sees and hears or is it just where I am? And of course, when you start to hear that, no, sadly, it's very universal, then you start to find that strength to actually say, I'm going to find the person who can go and challenge this situation with me. It's very hard to be in the low maverick, very hard. And uh, Kaviri, in, in India and other places in your experience, there's um, a statistic about cesarean sections in the UK, which always puzzled me, which is that about nine or 10 percent of women go in with a plan. In other words, you know, the specialists and midwives and doctors have decided that uh, there are risk factors or that the best option. Four or five days later, 25 percent have come out having had a cesarean section uh, with some indicators that now you know, as a, a statistical nerd, that looks like something happening that was completely unplanned on a very large scale. Does that kind of thing happen across India? Or, I mean, do they publish the statistics? Because there's a big row in this country about stopping publishing these statistics so that annoying people like me can't ask questions like that. They do publish those kind of statistics, but I think you can, you will Google it and you'll see it. And even, you know, if you want to, know the very different kind of range between uh, of cesarean sections, between not just um, public and private sector, but also urban and rural. So there is that kind of divide as well. So you'll see parts of India has like 85% um, in private sector. Parts of India then is at 2%. So within the state where I work, it's you know around 40% in private sector, around two to 3% in public sector. So that tells you something too, right but um to give you a better idea of this decision making because the people i uh, do my research with are not the ones who are at the you have the luxury of electing cesarean section right um but the people i studied with the the people i grew up with people in my family my cousins my uh, you know everybody is uh, even people who do not go with the plan of cesarean section like my cousins and everybody they will, no matter if you have been to a hospital for antenatal checkup, and most people will go to private sector, they will get a cesarean, they will find a way. But people with my background, I remember when I was getting my education, well, while I came out with like a secondary tocophobia, which I can now name, but a lot of us were looking at this experience and <clears throat> just thinking, that's not what I'm going to go through it's much better to go for an elective cesarean section. We were all making plans about getting an elective cesarean section and not go through that humiliation. We will, and because nursing and midwifery doesn't pay very much, a lot of my friends kind of saved a lot of money for years so they can afford an elective cesarean section in a private sector and you know, be able to afford a dignified experience. Very interesting. Um, we've got a question from uh, Nora Belagio asking, um, where are you likely to publish your PhD? And also, I know that you've worked with people at WHO and others. Um, where is there a, a, a platform that people can find out more about this, the work that's being done on obstetrics violence? Um, who else is publishing on this? And are you part of a wider study? I am part of many studies and many different kinds of work. Most of my work is uh, qualitative and I believe in understanding. I, I don't, I feel we still haven't understood what women's experiences are. So I do something called birth mapping. Um, it helps you understand women's embodied experiences in the truest form that, you know, I have not done before. It's arts-based. It's uh, based on, it's adapted from body mapping. So you can check it out. Um, I do a lot of work on the theory part of it, on understanding why women experience this intersectionality comes into play, abolition comes into play. Um, many feminist and uh, uh, critical theories come into play. So those kind of works. Um, I will share some of those links. I have already published uh, some of my doctoral work on women in birth but I'm mindful that I do not want to publish all my work in journals which are being produced by countries from Global North. I have one paper accepted uh, in, a, in a feminist journal called Agenda, um, which is coming out uh, from South Africa. 
Um, so yeah, and a lot of work okay. is currently in the process of coming out. Okay, okay. and um, I'm just thinking about how people can uh, campaign around some of these wider issues. I mean, you mentioned uh, women having IUDs inserted without uh, permission, etc. cetera. Um, people of my generation can remember the early rows about Depo-Provera being tested in India without consent um, and some of these uh, wider issues. Just say a little bit about what you think the role of midwives are in that wider context of campaigning for women's rights to control all aspects of their, uh, their fertility, if I can put it that way. Now, what kind of role would they play in India? We as midwives are supposed to be an advocate for women, right? That's, that's our role. So that has to be our role in India and in any part of the world. But our situations, our health system, our, our policies, politics, bureaucracy, a lot of it makes it very difficult to do that. So our role is very simple, but there has to be so much advocacy for midwives by midwives from other parts of the uh, world as well to, to help us you know, get to that stage where we can actually take a stand and not fear for our life and our job and our mm -hmm. children and everybody so we can do our job well. We know what we have to do. It's just a lot has to happen before that so we can do that. Okay, Diana, as we come to an end, a final reflection from you on what you've heard from Kaviri and what you've seen at the ICM this week. Mm -hmm. What stunned you the most? I think standing up for women. It's not just about being advocates, but physically standing up for women. Um, that to me is, is exactly what we're here for doing. And I've hoped all my career that's what I've done and will continue to do as long as I can. Yep. Okay, well, on that uh, very strong note, um, can I just thank both of our speakers tonight for sometimes a slightly grueling discussion, uh, but a reminder, as we've seen through the ICM, uh, of the very wide spectrum of experience that women have in birth around the world and that uh, midwives have to struggle uh, to deliver services in around the world. There's a long way to go, but hopefully these kinds of videos and things can speed up the rate at which understanding and changes move forward. So uh, Diane and Kaviri, can I thank you very much? And can I say to everybody that uh, the videos from this will be published uh, on Friday morning, and you'll be able to pick them up through the various social media challenge channels, and you can share them and discuss them. And a big thanks again to All for Maternity and Matflix for supporting us and making these possible. And we'll see you again uh, next week when I'm sure you'll all be delighted that Sue McDonald is back and uh, you don't have me stumbling through the agenda. So to both our speakers, thanks and good evening to everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Welcome back Thank to the you. Maternity and Midwifery Forum. Maternity services haven't stopped over the last 16 months, and neither have we. We've continued to bring maternity and midwifery professionals and students the latest policy updates, best clinical and technical innovations, and research via our live streamed festivals throughout the pandemic. We've introduced the Maternity and Midwifery Hour to enable healthcare professionals to come together as a community each week to share their experiences. We've even added a new festival to our annual series. The Student Midwife Experience Festival will take place on the 10th of November in Manchester and will be a great opportunity for student midwives and academics to examine how the current curriculum will react to changes in maternity services. We'll also be talking about what students want and how universities and educators can adapt their courses, mixing practical and online learning. We've also redesigned the Maternity and Midwifery Forum website to create a space where you can catch up with all the latest articles, watch videos, find out about forthcoming events and advertise your own. Not satisfied with that, we will shortly be launching our new Maternity and Midwifery Services and Products Directory, a one-stop shop for all healthcare professionals who want to find out about the latest products, services, career opportunities, campaigns, courses and resources. Take part in our exhibition competition today and get an early glimpse of the directory before it is launched to maternity and midwifery professionals and students later in July.